Hi, thank you for tuning in. Welcome to the It's Your Money and It's Your State workshop series brought to you by our nonprofit organization, Financial and Estate Literacy. Our mission is to empower people like you to take control of their finances, their estate, and charitable giving decisions. For the past 25 years, our founder, Peter Cote, and our entire team have been providing these free, unbiased, and accessible six weeks programs all over Orange County, California to help you make informed choices that align with your unique needs and values. Now let's start the program. This webinar is the sixth and final session of the It's Your Money program. The topic is Financial Planning Part 2. Our guest speaker is Marty McNamara. Our moderator is Peter Coates. And this webinar is brought to you by Sigurdstrom Center for the Arts. Enjoy the workshop. Let's bring Marty on board here, who's going to be our presenter. Good morning. Hey, hey good morning, Marty. How are you? Happy to be here. Celebrate Halloween. Excellent. Good, excellent. You. Well, Marty's been one of our presenters for since the pioneer days. He's been uh, presenting for a long time. And um, let's start with your ask first, Marty. Why don't you tell us where your education is from? Okay, sure. I'll share my screen and pull that up. But okay. uh, while I'm doing that, I went to college at the University of Dayton in Ohio and um, studied accounting and finance there. Those were the, okay. my majors there. Nice, nice. And then made your way to the West Coast after that? That's right. I moved to Orange County in 2007. Uh, so I've been here for 17 years. Um, and I've been working in this industry really since I graduated college. Fantastic. Uh, and as everyone can see, look at number two uh, for credentials. Marty's a CPA, a C, I mean, a PFS, and also a CFP. Uh, We've heard of CFP before in this class, and that's a certified financial planner, but it's really neat that Marty has the credential of a CPA, a certified public accountant. And remember, those are two of the three um, most distinguished credentials that we recognize, the third one being a CFA, the Chartered Financial Analyst. Uh, but it's really interesting to have uh, someone that has both those credentials, a CPA and the CFP, because uh, I imagine most um, financial decisions has a tax element um, with that. Um, are, are you guys doing a CPA work with your firm, Marty, or is that just a, a, an added credential? We do help clients with individual tax returns, uh, but we're not doing traditional accounting, bookkeeping services outside of the personal income tax arena. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Um, and Series 65, tell us a little bit about that. What does that mean? Yeah, the Series 65 is a, a license to give investment advice. Okay. So it's, it's an exam that was passed. It just uh, legally allows me to give investment advice to our clients. All right. Very good. Well, I'm glad you're not practicing law. It's um, You're on the good side over here. <laughs> <laughs> tell us a little bit uh, about your compensation. How's your and your group paid? So... Our firm is a fee-only firm, which means 100% of our revenue comes directly from our clients. No third parties are paying monies to us as advisors or to our firm. Fantastic. And give us an example of what would be, so if you had a million dollars of assets under management, what would that fee be? Yeah, so we uh, the fee on that would be a percentage of assets under management charged at 1% in, in annual rate. And we we bill that quarterly. So 1% of a million dollars is $10,000. And it would break down to $2,500 per quarter. Fantastic. And uh, do you have a minimum um, that you like to work with? Yeah, minimum investable assets for our firm is $2 million. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's see. So financial products, you don't have anyone in your office that buys or sells financial products uh, that are affiliated with annuities, insurance, or mutual funds. Um, oh, and then I'm sorry, skip number five, uh, that true, you are always a fiduciary and right. put your interest before your clients. So that's good. Um, for the attendees, you want anyone that's filling out this ask first, they need to be marking number five true. 
and number seven false. Those are your two biggies. And then how are they getting paid? Um, okay, so we've got your, your address and your contact information there as well, Marty. Uh, if any of our attendees uh, wanted to reach out and um, have a consultation, do you offer a, a consultation? Yes, we're happy to do that at no charge. Fantastic. Uh, so, so we could get that set up. Um, all righty. Well, let's get started with our uh, with our slides. Uh, welcome, Marty. Okay. Thank you. I'll pull up the slides here. Okay. So this is financial planning two that we're going to cover today. Thomas Anderson uh, went over financial planning one and. Um, I'm going to jump to the financial planning process. Uh, this is, hopefully looks a little familiar from Thomas's presentation. Uh, this is the process that certified financial planners are taught uh, to go through with their clients. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it was already covered in a previous presentation, but I think it does help set the stage for today's topic, which is financial planning too. Um, we probably talked about some of these items here. Um, I think the um, the thing that I like to emphasize is what I call the three C's in red font at the bottom of the slide. Um, all of these different areas like insurance, asset allocation, cash flow planning, education funding, um, income tax planning, estate planning, these are all areas that can overlap with each other. And so we want to make sure that they're all um, coordinated with one another. Uh, the, the approach is very comprehensive, right? We, it, we don't want to necessarily work with somebody that's just going to focus on investing money in one account and not look at our whole balance sheet or not look at um, cash flow into the future to determine what our withdrawals may be from investments. We want somebody that's going to look at all these different aspects of our financial plan. So that that's best summarized with the word comprehensive. Uh, so we want comprehensive, coordinated, and then customized. We want somebody that's going to look at our situation, give us advice in our best interests, and not just use rules of thumb for all of their clients, right? Because what may be helpful to one client may not be helpful to another client. And so I think uh, a financial, a certified financial planner can help you with that. And it's that customized approach that's going to be most meaningful to you. Yeah, we try to encourage our attendees um, in in this sessions and the earlier sessions to make up their own income statement, a personalized income statement, and also a net worth statement. Uh, in your practice, Marty, are, is that very, very valuable when um, when you're starting off the engagement? Absolutely. Yep the the balance sheet is a starting point for all of our conversations, so that okay. we can understand the current situation of the client, um, and then as income statement that helps us understand you know what the client's expenses look like uh, you know we'll look at income tax returns generally to get an idea of what their income looks like but um, that that's also where we're going to see some opportunities too to hopefully um, minimize income taxes uh, the approach that we take is very um, it's a long-term approach to minimizing income taxes so we want to um, think about the client's lifetime effective tax rate. Sometimes I think uh, clients or, or tax preparers can be focused on minimizing taxes in any one given year at the expense of potentially future years. We want to take a holistic approach over a client's whole lifetime and look at what can be done to minimize the total taxes that are being paid to the government over their entire lifetime. And, and sometimes that may mean paying a little bit more in a year when you're in a lower tax bracket so that you can hopefully pay less taxes later in life. Yeah, yeah, so as, as the attendees, as you guys can see, it's very important that we have this um, income statement and, and net worth statement. It's that foundation of these conversations. So getting into any of the goals or the expectations, uh, just having that conversation with the advisor, you really need that foundation. Um, so uh, for all of the attendees out there today too, I implore you to, to start that process. It's not a fun process, but start that process of doing an income statement and a net worth statement. All right. Great. And then uh, today's course is going to 
you know, we're, we're doing somewhat of a recap on the financial planning one, but I think it's also going to tie in financial planning to the investments, right? And you've had some courses on investments already. So we're going to figure out how we marry those two together. That's that's a big part of what I want to talk about today. Um, if there's any questions, it looks like we've got um, fewer than, well, we've got about 20 attendees. So if, if there's questions, please don't hesitate to type them in and we'll do our best to answer those. Um, we'd be happy to take any questions and make this interactive. Uh, but um, right now we'll, we'll get into the investments and, and how those can hinge on a financial plan. So um, the hierarchy for deciding on how to invest a client's money really starts with determining the time horizon for that money uh, or the time horizon for their goals. That, that time horizon is in, in many ways going to be tied to cash flow projections, right? Those are projections that help us understand when there's going to be money spent and at what periods of time um, we can uh, plan for those withdrawals from their portfolio. Um, then we'll also look at risk tolerance, right? This is kind of um, a pillow test. Right? What can a uh, client, what sort of risk tolerance can someone accept and sleep sleep with at night? <laughs> yeah. uh, so but, true. <laughs> yeah. And, and a lot of times too, I think some of that we, we see on a balance sheet where somebody may have uh, what appears to be a very aggressive investment portfolio. But then when we look holistically, they may have a lot of money in cash and bank accounts. Uh, and so piece these accounts together, we may say, well, may maybe you're not as aggressive as as you think you are. And, and maybe there is an opportunity to potentially earn um, some higher returns on some of the cash in bank accounts. Um, doesn't always come up, but I think it's a relevant uh, takeaway from balance sheets. When we look at the personal net worth or the, the personal balance sheet for a client, it helps us understand um, if there's opportunities to enhance returns on, on different accounts. Uh, Marty, do you have a, like a certain set of questions or a questionnaire that you'd like to use when you're assessing a client's risk uh, when you get to know them? Uh, we we do. Yeah, we have um, a risk tolerance software that we'll use and, and it goes through and asks clients different questions to help us understand how they might respond in different return environments. Um, it's just one piece of the overall um, you know, consideration to how their money gets invested. Right, right. Uh, it, it is something that we utilize, absolutely. And, and we have compliance uh, restrictions too that, that force us to use some of those tools, right? We, mm -hmm. if, if we were to be audited by the SEC, we want to be able to prove that we we did that and as part of our um, investigation and working with the client. Very good. So a time horizon, risk tolerance, and then we'll look at asset classes. So you talked a little bit uh, earlier today, Richard, about large cap, mid cap, small cap. Those can be different um, asset classes within the domestic equity world, but we can also look at those in international equities. We can look at uh, asset classes like real estate, bonds. Um, there's different types of as sub asset classes within bonds. So. We want to look at which asset classes make the most sense. Um, when we're approaching asset classes, we're frequently looking to reduce risk. So if, if a client has um, a very heavy allocation to one asset class, we may want to look to add other asset classes. That's part of how financial planners and advisors will reduce risk is spreading out um, the investments across different types of asset classes that may behave differently in different return environments. Um, so we'll have some charts on that. We'll also want to understand in the end, what's the best mix of those asset classes, right? We may want to have some small cap stocks, but but maybe we want to have a, a larger portion of large cap stocks. Um, we may want to have some bonds, but what's the right percentage of bonds in there? And a lot of that's going to look towards the time horizon for goals, but I think just helping understand what's that right mix. Um, we'll frequently see a pie chart used for the asset class mix, just to, um, for asset allocation. And then once we understand what mix of asset classes we're using, how are we selecting the actual securities, right? If we want to own large cap stocks, are we going to buy the S&P 500 index or do we want to 
go and do that in a different type of security? Um, Would we want to buy something that maybe isn't um, just an index fund? Maybe it can do um, something a little bit better, but doesn't cost quite as much as an active manager. So there's that, uh, I think, factor that comes up within each asset class. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Reduce those fees is a good yeah. way to do it. And for fixed income, I think um, understanding the client's tax situation is important because we want to know, are the clients better off with taxable fixed income? It's paying higher interest rates, but they have to pay income taxes on the interest income, or are they better off with tax-free bonds? And there's no taxes due um, on the interest income that's earned, but the, the interest income is typically a lower rate than the taxable counterpart. Yeah, and I think it's good to point out too is that the you know Marty's uh, speaking of municipal bonds that could be tax free federal and state if it's California, but also remember on uh, treasuries, uh, federal treasuries are taxed at the federal level, but they're not taxed at the state level on your interest. That's right. Yeah, it's good to know. All right. Okay, so financial planning too. This is the meat of what we're going to talk about for the rest of the presentation. Uh, if you've got any questions, please type them in and we'll try to address those as we go through it. All right. Oh, I love this chart. <laughs> the yeah. quilting chart. What do you like about it, Richard? I, I love the randomness of it. Like you, it really goes to show that whatever happens in the past, there's no way to predict the future. Yeah. And everyone, everyone kind of has their day in the sun, you know, it's just, it just depends on all the, the economic climate of what's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean. Yeah. I like that too. I, and what we're looking at here, for those of you uh, that are just looking at a chart like this for the first time, um, we've got a column uh, for every calendar year um, going back to 2009. So 2009 through year to date. Uh, 2024 as of the end of last month, September 30th. Um, so we've got a column for that. And then uh, the rows are sequenced um, at the top, the highest returning asset class, and at the bottom, the lowest returning asset class. Um, and I think what you'll see is it's pretty hard to identify a pattern. I mean, if I look back, you know, at this time horizon, I see that cash and commodities were frequently the lowest returning asset classes. Uh, dating back to 2009. Um, if we go up to the top, I see that that uh, the real estate investment trust, this uh, REITs, ha had a nice run from 2010 through 2015. But really, there, there's no discernible pattern. As Richard pointed out, it's completely random. And yeah, so yeah. So Marty, can you take a moment and uh, describe REITs? I'm not sure if they've talked about it on Financial Planning One, but it'd be good to, to let everyone understand what a REIT is. Yeah, yeah. So the way I kind of think about REITs is it's a way to invest in real estate where um, it, it's publicly traded, right? So the, you can buy private REITs, but the REITs as measured on this chart are just looking at publicly traded REITs. Um, they invest in real estate. Um, these are companies that own different types of real estate, could be different um, asset classes, it's generally going to be industrial, uh, commercial properties, um, retail, potentially properties, but uh, real estate investment trusts are required to distribute uh, income out to shareholders. Uh, and then they trade on exchange, just like uh, publicly traded stock would. Yeah, yeah, excellent. And, yeah, and you mentioned that requirement, there's a certain percentage of their income that has to be distributed by law or by, you know. By yeah, their... I think it's 90%. Yeah, it needs to be distributed out to the owners of the company. You know, it's really interesting on year 2009. So that was the year following the big crash in 2008, where markets were way down. Right. Um, amazing to see, you know, equity and high yield at such high percentages for one year. Uh, yeah. 59 percent, 59 percent. Yeah, March of 2009 was when the market bottomed out of the great financial crisis. So really, we saw a pretty steep turnaround in the, the last nine months of 2009. And that's where we're seeing these outsized returns, right? This EM is emerging market equity with 79% return. Um, yeah. That was the best place to have had your money for calendar year 2009. Um, then, the worst uh, place to have had it, cash. It's Boy, cash, yeah. Yeah. But then, then you check out 2018, 2018. 
cash was the best spot getting 1.8% and everything else was terrible. Everything was negative in right. 2018. So it's, uh, yes. It, it, and, and that idea of, uh, you know, if we look at 2023 and we see large cap at, at the top, we can't say that large cap is going to do the same 2024 or, you know, we're in the middle of 24. So we might know, but just that, that randomness is really important that um, you, you often see that on the warning statements, past performance does not guarantee future returns. <laughs> it's really true. That's right. That's right. Yep. So yeah, tell us I, a little I, bit about the, so the, so the white boxes then that is the white boxes is a certain percentage of each one of these indexes. That's that, right. It's a blend. Okay. It's a blend of all these indexes. Uh, the, the fine print lays it out, but it's essentially like a, a 60% equity, 40% bond portfolio that owns some of all of these asset classes. And so you can see that if we were this asset allocation box, this is the, the white box with the black font and it has a, a line going through it. You can see there, you're, you're never at the bottom, right? You're never at the worst, but you're never gonna be the best either. And that's kind of um, what the objective is, is uh -huh. to protect the risk from being all the way at the bottom, right? But what we also see is we see a lot of positives there too. When I look at that, um, really hard to have lost money. It looks like there's only three years on this chart where there was a loss. Um, it was 2011 where that portfolio lost 0.7%. 2015, where it lost 2%, and then 2022, where it lost 13.9%. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So uh, I think it's just, um, it's that approach to spreading out risk. And we're okay with knowing we're never going to be the best, as long as we also know that we're never going to be the worst either. And I think that's, that's important part, important takeaway from this chart. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good. Okay, so now we're going to dive in a little bit to just kind of talk a little bit. And I think some of this was probably covered in the investing classes, but just want to look at, um, you know, I, I mentioned that pie chart earlier and I think in understanding um, how we want to allocate to these asset classes within the pie chart is uh, pretty important just to understand the different risks that we're taking there. And um, equities it represents ownership in a company. Right. Mm -hmm. when you say when we use the word equities. We're generally we're talking about publicly traded equities, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes clients have investments in businesses or um, more privately held um, equities. This is not that. This is publicly traded equities that that we're looking at here. We like to break those out um, by style. So we think about them as you know, are they value companies or are they growth companies? Growth companies may have a higher potential to earn return, but they typically have lower profitability than, than value companies. Um, geography, you wanna break them out by um, country, uh -huh. and then market cap, which you talked about, right? Which is the, the number of outstanding shares times the stock price, which helps us understand the total value or market capitalization of that, of that company. Yeah, that's, and so the general consensus is that the larger the company, the larger the market cap, the stronger the company, um, the more predictable the company and the less risk. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, I think so. Um, there's also a, a slightly lower return expectation. Uh -huh. Large cap companies, um, if we look back, you know, over 100 years, small com companies have had higher returns. So you are being rewarded in theory for that, the risk in the, the smaller companies. But, um, you know, if we look back at the, uh, this chart here, uh -huh. you can see the large cap companies are going to be these, the green box and uh, yeah. the small cap is the orange box. If we look back over this time period, I think more often than not, the large cap actually had higher returns. So you can see small cap was the best in 2013, 2016, 2020. Right. Um, but then you got large cap in large 19. Cap in, yeah, yeah. And then 19 and 23. Yep. Um, okay. Okay, good. So, yeah. So, so little, maybe a little more risky on the small cap, but you have a chance of better return at, on a, at a given time. 
Yep. Okay. Yeah, we tend to think about small cap stocks as like the bottom 10% of the market cap. So you're generally going to have a lower or smaller allocation to small cap stocks than you will to large cap stocks. And that's true across most advisors. Most firms that you work with are going to have a smaller allocation. They're just, a, they make up a smaller segment of the market. Excellent. Yep. Okay. Um, I think international is a big um, look back to at that one. I mean, just international tends to get broken up into two major asset classes. Um, one is developed market equities. So that's the, the gray box, the DM equity. And then you've also um, got the EM equity, which is the emerging markets. So you got your developed markets. Think of that as like Europe, um, Japan are going to be the two biggest countries like Western Europe and, and Japan. Um, those are your developed markets. Your emerging markets are going to be um, more China, India, uh, some South American countries also fit into the emerging market equity index. So a little more volatility in the emerging market space. Okay. Okay. And then um, certainly, those... certainly more room for growth though, long run. Right. And that, and those two, both emerging and, and, um, uh, developed they're and they're not a large percentage of a portfolio either are they they're kind of a smaller percentage yeah so it, that depends on the advisor and how much they're allocating i think when you look at all the publicly traded stocks in the world um, today it's probably about 70 percent of the market cap is u.s okay stocks okay. Um, it's it's in the high 60 potentially 70 percent of the market cap um international stocks are um, you know, going to make up, uh, you know, 35, they could be 35% of the, uh, publicly traded market cap in the world. But I think you'll typically see investors have more of an allocation to domestic equities than just that, um, within their equity portfolio. So I, we think it, it makes sense to allocate at least 10, if not 20% or more to international equities. Um, okay. That's just within the equity portfolio, right? But there's definitely long range benefits. Uh, what's not pictured on this chart is the um, the the early 2000s, right? But from 2000 through 2009, the S and P 500 or the large cap domestic equities was basically flat. No money was made during that decade in U.S. stocks. So if you owned international stocks during that decade, you still made money, right? But right. I um, that's where the benefit of diversification really helped was that first decade of this century. Um, you know, this you're moving on to the next decade, though, you're much better off in in the domestic equity asset class. So this is why we we spread it, spread it out. Yeah, good. good. Right. Uh, real, oh, I'm sorry, Mario, go back one side yeah. real quick yeah. on that bottom one there on taxes. Uh, explain qualified dividends versus unqualified. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. The the qualified dividends are companies. Uh, they're generally domestic companies that are going to be um, that where their dividends are taxed at capital gain, long term capital gain rates. So those rates are either going to be zero percent, fifteen percent, or twenty percent. They're lower rates than the ordinary dividend rates. They're non qualified dividends. Those are taxed at ordinary income, and they're they're going to be at a higher tax rate. Um, REITs, for example, are taxed as non qualified dividends. So okay. those assets um, may frequently be better owned in retirement accounts where yeah. the dividends are not showing up on a 1099 anyway. I mean, yeah. if you have a taxable brokerage account, that that could be the place to own more qualified dividends that are that are taxed at the lower tax rates. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. And then you're not paying the taxes. Uh, it, you know, speaking of REITs too, some of our attendees might be um, real estate. They might have a real estate portfolio and are you able to do a, like a 1031 exchange and not actually get a physical property, but have that, that go into something similar to a REIT where you still have real estate, but you, you don't have to pay your capital gains from the sale of the property? Yes, for investment properties, um, clients can do a tax deferred exchange into another property. Um, and after about four years, they can they can own a REIT that owns many properties, 
and then they can also start to sell off partial shares oh, wow. of that. That's nice. So it's it's an interesting way to defer taxes, but also continue to to own real estate, get income from real estate. And it's nice because I think sometimes um, if clients own one property, it's really hard to, to sell just a small fraction of that property, right? Yeah. They yeah. have a property worth a million dollars. Um, they may not need all million dollars cash, but maybe they need $50,000 cash. And so, uh -huh. um, you know, what's the best way to get that? You know, if they're in a REIT, they could sell $50,000 worth of shares and still continue to own $950,000 worth of the REIT. Um, so it, it allows them to kind of break that up a little bit and not have a major tax taxable gain in one year. Um, if they do want some liquidity, but not, not liquidating the entire real estate investment. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bonds. Here okay. To move go. on to bonds. Okay. Fixed income or bonds. So um, I always tell clients uh, bonds are very predictable if we hold them to maturity, right? It, it's this concept of loaning money to a government or a company. And we know we're going to receive interest payments. And then at the end of the bonds, life or its maturity date, we're going to get back all of our principal and one last interest payment. Uh, we know what that return is going to be the day we buy the bond. Um, the only risk is default, right? If, if, if there's a, a default, then that return is going to be uh, a lot lower than we would expect. And that's where we want to understand what is the risk of default? What is a default risk? Um, and that's frequently why we'll buy bonds from multiple issuers or use a fund to go out and do that so that we get diversification. Um, but the uh, the idea of having a defined uh, return and, and a reliable stream of cash coming in can be very helpful in that time horizon planning that I talked about earlier. So we think about bonds as safe money. Uh, and, and a lot of times we want to look at how much uh, a client's going to be withdrawing and then try to have at least five years of safe money. Uh, in their portfolio so that if we do have these major swings in the portfolio, like we had during the great financial crisis or during COVID um, March of 2020 or, or during um, late nineties, early two thousands with the tech bubble uh, fill in the blank. There's other examples of that. If we have these periods of really high volatility where there's losses in the stock market, we're able to draw on the bonds and let the stocks have time to come back up. And I think that's really important, that time horizon for the client's money um, and using bonds for safety so that we're not forced to sell equities at a price well below what we paid for them. Very good. And I, and so I, just on the basic understanding, um, a person would buy a bond for $1,000 uh, and they would be getting an interest rate uh, that it's paid out as a coupon. So that's that interest rate that comes out. And then there's a yep. duration of time and that's that maturity date. So if you had a five-year bond, cost you a thousand, you're going to get your thousand dollars back after five years. And in between, you're going to be getting these coupon payments, whether it's 2%, 3%, or 4%. Um, what, what are some of the potential like volatility risk, I guess, you know, how, how do we, how do we grade that? How do we know that it's risky? Yeah. Yeah. The, the great question that really two main risks to think about when it comes to bonds, one is default risk. And, and we look at that by looking at the credit of the issuer. So just like companies that loan to individuals want to know the credit, your credit score, um, we're going to try to look at the credit score, quote unquote, of, of these governments or um, companies that, that are being that are receiving the money and holding the money. Okay, so that, that's one way. The second way is the time horizon or the maturity date. Um, so the, the uh, longer the maturity, the further out the maturity is, the more sensitive the bond's value is to interest rate movements. So if I, if I have a bond that matures in one year, I don't care all that much about what happens to interest rates in one year's time. Uh, you know, that that's a pretty short amount of time until I'm going to get my money back. If I have a bond that matures in 10 years, there could be a lot of fluctuations. And if I needed to sell that bond at year five, I may be selling that bond at a gain or a loss. 
And so that's where we start to see uh, on the, the longer duration um, bonds, a um, little more risk uh, as, it, as it pertains to interest rates. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A quick lesson on that too is uh, the interest rate has an inverse uh, effect on the cost. Uh, so an example would be if you bought a five-year bond for 3% right now, for a thousand bucks, you're going to get your, you're supposed to get your thousand bucks back after five years. Uh, and then interest rates change in between that time. And let's say interest rates are at 5%. Now your 3% bond is, is a dog. Everyone in the market can go out and get a 5% bond. And right. so that's going to decrease the value of your bond. If you tried to sell it on the open market, uh, you might get $800 for it, you know, taking a loss from your original investment. Uh, so just kind of understand that when interest rates increase, values of your your lower coupon rate is going to decrease and vice versa. That's exactly right, Richard. And what I like to point out is if you don't need to sell that bond and you do hold it till maturity, you will get your thousand dollars back. Yeah. So all those yeah. fluctuations in the value of that bond in the meantime didn't really matter <laughs> because yeah. you didn't sell it. You held yeah. it till maturity you got exactly what you bought day one. So that's where we, we will use individual bonds in some instances for clients to help plan for planned expenses, right? If we know there's a big expense coming up or a need for money, you know, a, a treasury bond isn't a bad way to go out and say, I know I'll have, you know, X amount of dollars a year from now um, and, and I'll be getting some interest on it along the way. And another thing, um, we talked about diversification in the equity market and stocks. What kind of opportunities are there in a, a well-diversified bond portfolio? Do they have ETFs or mutual funds or how do we, how do we get a little, you know, not buy one directly, you know, not just buy one issue on our own, but how do we get a good mix of it? Yeah. Yeah. You can absolutely use mutual funds or, or ETFs to go out and buy bonds. Um, there you're buying a basket of bonds, just like you are with a basket of stocks. So um mm -hmm. I think you you want to understand what is the duration, right? What, what's the the blended duration across this basket of bonds? When are these on average going to mature? Because a mutual fund or ETF that has a shorter duration is going to be less sensitive to interest rate fluctuations. Uh, a mutual fund or ETF with a longer duration is going to be more sensitive to interest rate fluctuations. And then you have to look at the credit risk too. Um, the higher the credit risk, generally the more income is paying out, the higher the yield. So sometimes clients will say, well, I like this bond fund. It has a really high yield. It pays out more than a, than other bond funds, but that's because there's more credit risk. There's a higher risk of default within those funds. And so understanding that is important. I'm not saying that doesn't mean you shouldn't own some, but it's, I think the emphasis on the word some there, you probably want to have some of that, but not all of your bonds in the high credit risk category. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Because th these these corporations that offer bonds, sometimes they go under, they might yeah. file bankruptcy or, or just uh, fold. And, uh, and you lose out every all the all the bond uh, holders are going to lose out on getting their money back. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think there's been a much higher um, rate of defaults in the uh, corporate bond area than than municipal bonds. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you know, people thought corporate bonds like uh, Enron is a good example, right? That's a company that people, you know, some years ago thought would have never gone under. And if you if you had a Enron bonds um, when they went bankrupt, I think that was a you know unfortunate outcome. But we we saw some, um, you know, bank bonds in the great financial crisis default, right? Two thousand seven through two thousand eight, we saw some defaults, and so I think uh, it can happen. So that's where it's important to make sure you don't just have it, have one corporate bond. You want to have, if you're going to have corporate bonds, you want to spread it out across different corporations. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Tell us about municipal bonds. Those are kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Municipal bonds. Um, it, if you're a California resident, like, like we are, um, they're entirely tax-free if you're buying California municipal bonds. That can be from a, a local municipality or, or state-issued municipal bond. Um, the interest income that pays out is entirely tax-free. If you buy a municipal bond from one of the other 49 states, you'll have to pay taxes on that only on your California income tax return. They're federally tax-free. 
So okay. Okay. that's where we want to look at the tax bracket for the investor, for our clients and understand, um, are they better off with a taxable bond that pays higher interest and paying taxes on that? Or are they better off with a tax-free bond and not paying taxes? Um, generally, what we're seeing is uh, if your tax bracket's in the 20s, your federal tax bracket, so 24% or lower, you're going to be better off with taxable bonds right now in today's interest rate environment. Uh, that could change. So, But just something to stay on top of. I think that's, you know, it's what you keep at the end of the day. It's what's yeah, absolutely. And it's, and it's nice too. You can mathematically crunch those numbers and figure that out, you know, cause you'll know what the municipal is paying versus what a taxable bond would be paying in that same category. So, uh, so it's easy to figure out, you know, yeah. does it make sense or not make sense? Yeah. I think the key there is just to be forward looking, right? Yeah. If we wait until uh, the tax return is done, that was already for a tax year that already happened. Right. So we need to be forward looking at the future tax years. And that's really more tax planning focused than it is just looking at the historical tax returns. So, yeah, you know, that's another good point, Marty. A lot of people yeah. think of uh, when's a good time to have a chat with my CPA and you're thinking March or April, that's the wrong time. It's, it's right now uh, in November and December when you want to talk with your CPA before the year's up um, to have that sit down and figure out if you're making any changes um, Marty, real quick on municipal bonds, what is our, our risk there? You know, it, it seems like they're less risky than a corporate bond, uh, and they're not quite a federally backed treasury. Um, but are, you know, overall, is our strength pretty good, or what's the take on that? Um, it's it similar to corporations. It depends on the credit of the issuer, right? Okay. So we want to look and compare. It, you know. The, the financials. And, th and that's pretty tough for individual investors to do on their own, um, which by the way, even if they could do that, frequently the pricing that they get on buying bonds as an individual retail investor is not good. Um, meaning they're overpaying for the same bonds that a much larger financial institution can go out and buy. And so uh, yeah. this can be an area where clients can be better off paying a financial institution to go do that on their behalf than to just self-manage. Um, and those financial institutions have the expertise to underwrite the credit of these municipalities to understand, you know, what is the credit score of this city or, or the government that we're, um, whose bond we're, we're going to buy. Yeah. 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 We saw issues with Orange County. Uh, what was that? Like, almost two decades ago. Yeah. Um, and, and it's important too, I think, to note what is, what is the backing of the bond? You know, some of these uh, California bonds is to build a, an athletic stadium or to, to build the toll roads. Uh, you know, so there's usually maybe a project behind it, or it could be um, the Los Angeles water district, or, you know, you, so there's something that you can, um, look at as the uh, as the asset or the backing of the bond uh, to help you evaluate. But you you brought up that other point too for the DYI person. It's it's difficult, and that's because of that spread, right? There's a there's a built in spread um, between the the issuer of the bond and the and the buyer of the bond, right? We, and 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 that information is not out there, right? I mean, it's not like we can go on the uh, you know, it's not like an open market where we know exactly what these spreads are. Yeah, we, we can go look at it historically. And so one of the things we'll do is look at uh, if a client comes into us with municipal bonds, we'll go back and look at what they were paying for their bonds versus what was a larger financial institution buying that same bond at. And it's one of those things where if you're buying at scale, right? So somebody that's buying tens of millions of dollars of, of these bonds, bond issuances is getting a much lower price than somebody that's just going out and putting 20 30, $50,000 into a, a bond, right? And it kind of makes sense. But I think when you look at it from a rate of return standpoint, you can be much better off using a financial institution and getting these bonds at lower prices that all, yeah. also ultimately end up in, in higher yields and, and better returns on your bond portfolio. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and the power of an ETF too, <laughs> that can that can buy a large yeah. portion of bonds in a single swipe. Yep, exactly. Uh, okay. Yeah, if you're using an ETF or a mutual fund, you're you're automatically getting exposure to it's going to be upwards of a hundred bonds and most ETFs and mutual funds, in some cases thousands. Wow, excellent, very good. 
All right, cash. Yeah, th this is um, this is the sliver of the pie chart that there wasn't much to talk about for a long time because interest rates were so low, and uh, it almost you know no matter what you did, if you got 0.01 or zero or 0.02 percent on your money, it really wasn't worth much time. Um, but that's changed uh, the last couple of years with interest rates increasing. Um, now you know interest rates in the the low five, four excuse me the low fives and high four percents are, are more the norm and so this has been an ongoing conversation an ongoing opportunity for us to help clients with earning higher return is this cash and cash equivalents um the whole conversation around fdic insurance right how do we spread out that risk so that we don't um, get stuck with a with a bank that went under which by the way there's some banks that went under um you know in the last couple of years we saw that with um you know, so I hear I hear a lot about um, on money markets. Uh, you know, so we talk about FDIC in the banking industry, but what's your take on uh, Schwab? You know, if you if you had a money market in Schwab, is you know, it's not it doesn't have the FDIC, but should we feel pretty comfortable that it's um it's, you're not going to lose your money in something like that? Yeah, yeah. So money market instruments are short term, typically like they they own different debt instruments maturing in less than ninety days. And you can go out and buy a mutual fund, right? A money market mutual fund that, that owns these Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard, fill in the blank. They, they have their own um, money market funds. And yeah, they, they are, um, they're incentivized to leave the price of those money market funds at $1. And okay. that price of that does not change. And they just pay out income. <clears throat> if they're in a situation where they bought some um, debt instruments that, that defaulted, those institutions are generally incentivized to make whole and keep the price of their fund at one dollar. Um, so, you know, we did see some concerns in the great financial crisis around uh, some of those funds. Breaking the buck was was kind of the lingo that was assigned to it. Um, but here, more recently, there hasn't been any real issues there, and, and they are very conservative investments. A good way to get um, you know a higher return on your cash. Uh, you can, they can be bought and sold any day the market's open. Uh, you're generally looking, depending on if they're tax free, um, you're probably, you know, in the high two percent on tax free money market funds. If you're in the taxable realm, it's going to be mid four. Yeah, yeah. Right now, um, and it's much much better than a savings account. But usually, the bank institutions aren't offering that much on savings accounts, so you'll see a lot right. more return. Yeah, yeah, or they may have some sort of teaser rate to get you to open an account that's good for, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, some limited amount of time, but then typically. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's quite a racket. Good, good. And then, uh, so now when we say risk, or it's it, when you say inflation risk, so it almost seems like the money markets are kind of close to inflation. You know, if inflation's going up, we're going to get a little bit more on the money market. Is is that kind of what we're saying when we when we're thinking of inflation? Yeah, I think um, another way to describe inflation risk is purchasing power risk. <clears throat> mm -hmm. The concept of, you know, what is my, will will a dollar tomorrow buy me the same that a dollar today does? And, and um, over time, that the answer to that generally becomes no. Right, mm -hmm. a dollar today is going to cost you to buy the same thing is going to cost you a dollar and five cents a year from now, or uh, maybe a dollar and three cents a year from now. So. Um, if you have your money all in cash, right, then you're taking a lot of purchasing power risk. And, and so I think that's where it, we would generally have the conversation to consider adding these other pieces of the pie into your um, pie chart so that you can hedge against the purchasing power risk that comes with having cash and only cash, right? We want to spread it out across some of these other asset classes. Excellent. And, and then as far as the amount that you're holding in cash or cash equivalents, um, you know, we talk about a safety net or is this kind of a, the emergency fund, just having that liquidity and we need something happens in medical issue or something, we need uh, money. Is, that, is yeah. that kind of the idea when you're planning? Yeah, that's the idea. I think, you know, a rule of thumb is like six to 12 months of living expenses in a highly liquid cash, cash equivalent. Um so yes, that's exactly right, Richard. Okay. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> um, alternative. Ooh. Yeah. So, so this is kind of a catch-all alternatives. You know, we just called this not one of the three to traditional asset class types. We talked about real estate investment trusts, right? So that that 
um, something that's out there, but there's all sorts of different investments that could fit into that uh, commodities, derivatives, reinsurance, where you're kind of giving insurance to insurance companies and the PE stands for private equity. Um, there's more mechanisms for investing in privately held companies um, today than there ever has been, right? It's a little bit easier to do that now than say 20 years ago. Um, so the the benefits of, of uh, alternative investments, lower correlation to the traditional asset classes and, and just being able to diversify, I think the biggest risk um, is liquidity risk. So the potential that you may not be able to sell those as easily, it doesn't apply to all of them. REITs can be sold just like publicly traded stocks. But uh, if I'm in, invested in private equity uh, deals, I may have a little bit more concern around how am I going to sell that when it comes time for me to sell. And um, <clears throat> they can be less regulated, more complicated to understand. So you know, a lot of times we th these asset, uh, the alternative investments just are not used in all client situations. Um, but just something to be aware of that they're out there. Yeah. Yeah. They're, and it's, you got to be aware of the, the learning um, factor on these things. And, you know, if you just take derivatives as a, as a topic, those are options where you're uh, buying an option or selling an option or a put or a call. And there's so many different variables, uh, so much to understand. Um, and it's, uh, and it's very uh, speculative, very risky. Um, so obviously the, the less you understand, the more risky it is. Um, so you really want to be aware of some of these, um, instruments that are out there. Uh, you know, real estate as a whole, I think is, is fantastic. And the REITs are fantastic too, because they have to follow certain rules and they're publicly traded. Um, but I agree with you, Marty, on the, on the PEs, the private equity, uh, they're so illiquid. You, you might be locked in for several years. And, and then the, it could just fold, you know, you, you, there's, you know, a lot of them just don't make it. Um, so really beware of stuff like this. And, and I would uh, not, I would not get involved. <laughs> it would be my recommendation. And if you were interested, make sure you talk to an advisor about it. Uh, real quick, Marty, what's the taxes on that last one? Depends on, okay. Yeah, so it can really vary. Important to understand going into these investments. Right. Even with just REITs, something that's liquid, <clears throat> they're non qualified dividends. They're going to be taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. So, you know, think about do you want to own those in a retirement account to, to not have to be concerned about the non qualified dividend income? Or is it okay to own those in a taxable account given your tax situation? Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Really good. Okay. okay. Uh, asset allocation. So, this is where we start to talk about what's the right mix? of these different assets. And, and, you know, this, this slide here just shows uh, the two asset classes, stocks and bonds, right? Bonds in the blue, the more bonds we have, the, the lower the expected return, the lower the risk. As we go up from left to right here, from defensive to conservative, moderate, and up to a growth based portfolio, we're adding more green, which is the stocks. We have higher risk and higher expected return. Uh, yeah, so. yeah, everyone should know their asset allocation. So if I say I'm 60-40, that means I'm 60% stocks and 40% bonds. Um, Marty and I are still out in the workforce. We're working, we're, we're, we're kids, we've got retirement to plan for, and we could take on a little bit more risk. So our asset allocation might be more stocks and less bonds. Uh, but as as we age and, and we retire, we're not going to be as aggressive and we're going to be more bonds and, and less stocks. Uh, but the point is, get an understanding of what your asset allocation is individually for each of you out there um, to to know it, understand it. And then it, it could be some fun for uh, for your next cocktail party and chat with the others. Hey, what's your asset allocation? Uh, I'm 60, 40. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just don't mix it up with the proof on the uh, alcohol at the cocktail party. Yeah. <laughs> Be clear, I'm 60% stocks, 40% bonds, and uh, 100 proof alcohol, whatever. But yeah, th this chart here is my favorite um, because I think it uh, it really helps us 
to zero in on how much money we can begin to allocate to stocks, the more risky part of the portfolio. Um, because if we look, uh, we've got these, these three columns or bars. The green one is 100% stocks. The blue one is 100% bonds. And then that gray is that 60-40 portfolio. They're okay, talking okay. stocks, 40% bonds. And we can see... If we've invested, and this this goes back to 1950, but okay. uh, you know, one one year returns could be a pretty wide range of outcomes over one year, right? No matter what you owned, um, you could have lost money over a year. Um, there's definitely more upside than downside. I think we see that over a year time, but certainly potential to lose money over a year's time. But as we go out to that five year time horizon, all of a sudden. It looks pretty good, especially if we're in a diversified 60-40 portfolio. Really tough to lose money uh, over a five-year time horizon. Uh, as we continue to go out over 10, 20 years, uh, it becomes near impossible to lose money over that 20-year time horizon when we're investing money in a 60-40 portfolio. Okay, And, and this just assumes that, that we're keeping our money invested and we're rebalancing annually. Um, no, no market timing here. And I think uh, what this does is it helps us determine what's the amount of safe money that the clients need to have. Uh, if we know that in five years or, or 10 years, we can expect positive returns from the equity portfolio. Uh, yeah, that's really neat. Uh, just for clarification, Marty, when when we say five-year rolling, so does that mean from 1955 to 19... I mean, from 1950 to 1955 would be one five-year group. And then do, do they do another five-year group of 1951 to 1956 and so on? Is that what, what does rolling mean? When yes, say that? that is, that's correct. Okay. Yep, okay. Yep. And, it, and it's annual total returns. Um, so it's based on the calendar years. So it's exactly what you said there. Okay. So each year they're doing another segment of either five years or 10 years or 20 right. years. That's interesting. So, so on the 20 year rolling, we just, we don't have anything negative. It, it just kind of absorbs that one negative year that we had, you know? That's um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's only on the hundred percent stock portfolio, right? Where you could have lost money over a decade. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, this is just using the S and P 500. So, you know, that decade would have been the first decade of the, the century, 2000, 2009, I think is likely in there. Um, you know, with the green in the one year were negative 37%. That that was um, calendar year 2008. Middle of the oh, great wow. crisis with the S&P 500 was down 30. So these are extreme periods of, uh, you know, performance. We Not the norm, but, but we never know. We never know what's ahead. The day we, you know, invest money in a portfolio could could potentially be the worst time, right? So yeah. I think that's where we want to make sure we have some safe money so that we're not having to sell um, the green bar, the equities when they're at a loss. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's an important comment too. And uh, that no one has that crystal ball. No one knows what the future is going to be. Our future returns is so important. And, and there's some uh, advisors or active investors out there. They, they think they do know that. Uh, so be beware. <laughs> it's important. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, people can be lucky, <clears throat> um, make yeah. timing calls, but it, it's very difficult to do that consistently over time. And um, that's where diversification is critical. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. Just get your money in the market, keep your expenses low and you'll get a return. Very good. All right. There it is. Diversification. Yep. So the, you can see here um, accumulating different securities to reduce risk of loss within a portfolio, right? So that time horizon is really, really key. Um, but then once we understand that, we're gonna we're gonna know how much money we want and that safe money, and then from there, how can we allocate to reduce risk outside of that safe money? And I think that that's really gonna look um, at all those different asset classes that we saw um, on the the chart with the calendar returns. <clears throat> um, we'll generally use baskets of security. So uh, think about baskets as mutual funds or exchange traded funds. Um, we will in um, 
some instances use separately managed accounts, which is a, another basket where clients are investing a half a million dollars or more in one asset class. And we will um, pay the manager to go out and buy the individual stocks in the client's account instead of, mm -hmm. and so the client will own, you know, if it's the S&P 500, they'll own 500 stocks in their account instead yeah. of one security. So there can be some different reasons why we do that um, that I probably won't get into here. But uh, the return expectation from an investment return standpoint is the same as if we were buying a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund. Um, Marty, can you take a minute real quick on uh, mutual funds and exchange traded funds just to describe the difference? And then uh, which ones do you like better and for and why? Sure. So um, mutual funds and exchange traded funds are both very similar in that they are a basket of, of stocks or bonds. Um, so you're able to buy one security and immediately have access to the returns of all the underlying um, securities in that basket. Uh, there's a small fee that's charged for the bundling into a basket. Um, and, and I say small, but um, could actually be high depending on, on yeah. mutual fund or exchange rate of funds. So generally we're going to favor the, the lower cost um, fees there, but we want to look at that and understand what we're paying for. Um, now the way that mutual funds trade is you can only buy or sell those once a day based on the closing price of all the underlying securities at the end of the day. Um, exchange traded funds trade more like a stock where that price is changing all day long. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and exchange traded funds have become the preferred basket um, for a couple different reasons. One, uh, now that all the brokerages have uh, waived trading on stocks or trading fees, on stocks and ETFs, it's free to buy and sell the ETFs. Yeah. Um, mutual funds can be free, but they can also charge ticket charges depending on the fund. Generally, the mutual funds with lower expense ratios. Um, for example, if you buy a Vanguard mutual fund in a Schwab account, Schwab's going to charge you uh, a, a flat fee. It could be uh, 20 some dollars, could be as high as $100. They'll charge you to buy that Vanguard mutual fund. Hmm. Okay. So, so that that's one reason why we like the exchange traded funds better than the mutual funds. We we don't have to worry about those ticket charges they're called to buy or sell. The second reason we generally like the exchange traded funds better is because they uh, they can be more tax efficient. So um, mutual funds are required to distribute capital gains to their shareholders uh, at the end of the year, and Exchange traded funds, um, by nature, the product design are able to absorb those with, within the fund more easily. And so we, there can be a capital gains distributions from exchange traded funds, but they're generally less than the mutual funds, or they may not exist at all. So um, more tax efficiency is the second reason we like the exchange traded funds better than mutual funds. Nice. Very good. Thank you. Yep. So not I mean, all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> oh, sorry. What's that? I was saying not all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> yeah. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. It's uh, all your eggs in one basket uh, can be a way that wealth is created, right? Mm -hmm. You bought Apple 20 years ago um, with $10,000. You're, you're sitting on a lot of Apple right now. Uh, stock. It, it, the same thing can apply to a small business or um, an individual piece of real estate. It could be a great way to um, create wealth. But it, it can be a very risky way to maintain wealth moving forward. And that's where diversification can come in to help preserve what, what wealth has been created. Um, it's, it's known in our industry, diversification is, they call it, it's the only free lunch. It's the only free way to, to reduce risk without giving up expected return, without reducing return. Yeah. Yeah. It really reminds me of that um, quilt chart that we looked at earlier today where all the different indices did had their day in the sun, you know, on the top of the list, but no, yep. they're so random. Uh, but that white, those white boxes showing um, diversification, you know, just a little bit of each one of these indices yep. and uh, you're going to get a return and you're not giving up the, the huge down or you're, you're giving up the huge downswings by not being, um, you know, in one separate asset. Yeah, that's neat. Free lunches. Everyone likes a free lunch. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, smart diversification, we touched a little bit earlier on uh, 
international equities and adding those. So th this shows you right here. Um, you know, some people can think they're diversified if they own the S&P 500 index fund, which, you know, gives you about 500 publicly traded companies in the world. But if you look, there's over 9,000 publicly traded companies trading in the world. So 500 is just a, you know, a sliver of what's out there. Um, so we think, you know, global diversification makes sense. Um, it can it can broaden the um, the return patterns and, and give people uh, lower risk in the long run. Um, we talked about the crystal ball, right, Richard? Uh -huh. Yeah. This yeah. Is, uh, this first chart here shows you, or I'm sorry, the first uh, column shows you that it, uh, if you if you select a mutual fund based on past performance, right? So if you said, hey, I want to invest in a mutual fund that's had uh, top quartile returns. Okay. Because I, I think if they were able to pick stocks and outperform an index and, and do better um, the last five years that they'll do better moving forward. And um, not the case. This shows you that the percentage of top rank funds, you know, rarely stay on top. So just 22% of equity funds and 31% of fixed income funds were able to maintain that. And it's really just random, right? You can't really attribute it to skill, uh, Although the managers that do it frequently will, they'll say, no, it's skill and you need to pay me a higher expense ratio because I can continue to do this. But then what we see in reality is it, it's very rare for them to continue to outperform an index and, and stay with top rank returns. Yeah, that's a real important <laughs> point, Marty, too, because you're right. When, when these active fund managers um, have their day in the sun and they beat their indice, so let's say it's a, like a large cap and they beat the S&P 500, they are proclaiming that to everybody. Oh, I'm doing so great. I beat the indice. Um, but remember, when the numbers that they're giving you is gross return, meaning they, you know, if the S&P 500 was 7% that year and they made 8%, that's what they're showing you is that 8%. You really want to know what their percentage is net of fees. They've got built in 12B1 fees. They've got other expenses. And so it might be 6% could be their return net of fees. Um, so, so yeah, you, you want to be aware. They, they're trying to proclaim they're doing great. They're beating the market. Uh, and they might even raise their fees because they think they, they can um, demand it because they're doing so great. Uh, but it really comes down to what is your net? What's your net return after all these costs? And that's really important. All right. Avoid reacting, so, investing. Yeah, yeah. This is, um, you know, I think when we looked at uh, some of the charts earlier, they showed us just <clears throat> maintaining a diversified portfolio and holding it for a period of time gives you a very high likelihood of positive returns once you hit five years. So, yeah, that's, that's so true. I mean, I, uh, back to the back to the cocktail party and. How are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm kicking butt on Tesla stock or I'm doing great on this one stock. You know, you might hear that. <laughs> and, and it's it's uh, what what someone has done. It doesn't mean that it's going to be good for the next person that jumps in. They could be jumping into that at, at the highest level and it, it could be going down. Um, and yeah, it's, it's an interesting psychology. You know, you you think you're making money on your investments or you're doing great. Um, but as soon as they start going down, it's a whole new world. Yeah. It's more fun to talk about one company, I think, too, than the diversified portfolio, right? So, but, yeah. but at the end of the day, I think the diversified portfolio kind of allows us to eliminate some of the emotions that can go into, you know, owning one individual company or just watching the market go up and down. If we know we have a plan in place and we're, we stick to the plan, we have a very high likelihood of success. I think that that's kind of the key, the key to the recipe here for, you know, having positive returns. And at the end of the day, it's not the returns. It's kind of what the, the money allows us to do that we're after, right? It's how we can fund our goals and live our lifestyle. And I think that's, that's really the important takeaway. Um, yeah, so you yeah, don't have absolutely. to be overly concerned about these volatile swings in the market. And, um, you know, with a diversified portfolio and the market takes a dive, we're generally going to buy some more. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Right it's, now, 
some of my clients, um, you know, the, the highest returns they've had were the stocks that they bought in March of 2020. Um, you know, that, that turned around really fast, but now when they say, I want to donate to a charity, what should I give to the charity? Um, we're looking at back at some of the stocks that they bought in March of 2020 going, wow, that's a pretty high return. Why don't we give some of this? So we don't have to pay capital gains taxes on it when we sell it someday. Yeah. That's a really good point too, Marty, that, uh, you, like how Marty's explaining, you got to look at your different baskets, meaning you might have a taxable account, an IRA account, or you might have a regular brokerage account that's taxable. And and if you're looking to charity, you got to find that there's better better ways to invest a charity. So uh, an IRA would be a better vehicle for a charitable contribution uh, because they don't have to pay the taxes and you don't have to pay the taxes uh, rather than you know uh, money that's in your pocket that you've already paid taxes on to give to the charity. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's really, really important to be looking at your different, um, your asset allocation and your different accounts, uh, what would coordinate well with charity. Looks like we might have a question here. Yeah. So, first one with 10 minutes left. So thank you. Awesome. All right. So is it best to own ETFs and or mutual funds in a retirement account versus an individual non-retirement account and why? That's a good one. All right. Take it away, Marty. Uh, I would say generally, no, it, it, it's the ETFs or the mutual funds are just a, a way that we invest in the securities. We a, we access the underlying securities. It doesn't really matter in a retirement account versus an individual account. But what you want to pay attention to is you may have some ETFs that are paying or mutual funds that are paying non-qualified dividends um, and, and or taxable interest income. You may want to own more of those in a retirement account. And you may want to own more um, mutual funds or ETFs that are not paying out taxable interest income. For example, maybe they're paying qualified dividend income um, or they just have higher expected returns in an individual account. Um, and that's just because you're the tax burden um, on those, the way that the, the 1099s work, you're, the um, interest income, dividend income in a in a retirement account does not show up on a 1099. You don't, which means you don't pay taxes on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really important to understand. You make a withdrawal. And even then, if it's from a Roth retirement account, there's no taxes. Yeah. 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 Uh, any, any dollar coming out of a regular retirement account, an IRA or 401k is uh, that's an ordinary income. That's taxable as ordinary income. Uh, but while it's inside that vehicle, like Marty's saying, there's no taxes. You could you could invest in all different types of uh, securities and, and there's no tax issue until that money comes out. That's a good question. All right. Um, so we, so managing your that decision, um, asset location. So that's that can be um, just which account's the best account for me to buy this investment, you know, this particular investment in. Yeah. And it's just every client's different. Some people have a really big IRA relative to their taxable account. Some people have no IRA and all their money's in a taxable account. So um, th that's where that customized approach is going to be helpful. All right. Um, There's a lot like of noise out, out there. Like, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Richard. I was I was leading us up to the next slide here. There, there's always a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of entertaining shows to watch and telling us how to invest and what's wrong and what's going on and something's happening in France. And, you know, how do we, how do we filter all that? Yeah. I think you have to keep in mind that um, the media needs eyes and ears to make money, right? They need listeners, watchers, followers on social media. So they need to make, make it uh, seem like it's really important when really a lot of, a lot of the news that's out there is very short term in nature has very little to do with the long-term perspective that we take that's based on your customized financial plan, your customized portfolio. So just brush it off. I think it, more than anything, it can be uh, you know, a distraction and, and something that can potentially create the emotions we were um, trying to avoid in the first place. And so uh, a lot of times it's tough for us to compete with our clients if they watch uh, CNBC all day you know, and that's all they're doing. It, you know, I can't be there, uh, you know, eight hours a day telling you what the stock market's doing. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I can be there to help look at your individual situation and come up with a long-term plan and make sure that, that we're tracking. 
Um, yeah, so I think that no, this is a this is an interesting subject. We we uh, uh, several years ago we used to have eight classes in the workshops, and one of the classes was this exactly this idea in the slide before is the emotional side, the psychological side of investing and how we manage our emotions. And they did a nice skit on um, uh, Kramer, the guy that does Mad Money, and he has all you know it's very flashy and a lot of uh, pizzazz. And they went back on all his recommendations to show how terrible they did, you know, recommend to buy this or sell that. And, yeah. um, and, and then they moved forward and, mm -hmm. and we saw that you would have done terrible <laughs> if you followed his instructions. Uh, so, yeah, so be beware, you know, you're, you're absolutely right, Marty. It's a sensational uh, arena out there um, and they're trying to put a lot of pizzazz into investing and it really doesn't need to be. Uh, looks like we might have another question here. All right, here we go. One more question. Uh, what are your thoughts on buying real estate, so the actual real property, versus a REIT? Yeah. Um, over time, both asset classes have done well. They've you know outperformed inflation, which is what we're after. We like to protect the purchasing power. I mean, that's, that's in generic terms. Um, I think you know, in terms of the real estate, it kind of depends what type of real estate is that residential real estate, you know, what asset class within real estate, but then also if you're owning real estate, you're generally going to have control, but you're also, you might, are you the one getting the phone call when the toilet needs to get fixed or is there a property manager there? And a lot of different considerations there. Um, I think it's, it's tough to really answer that, right? If you want to borrow, you can generally borrow money to buy, um, properties in real estate, but REITs, you're generally not going to borrow. Not that you couldn't take a margin loan, but it's just generally not advisable. Um, so REITs are going to pay an income stream. You know, you're not going to have to fix a toilet um, or a, a roof. It, you're just going to get get income and then you can, you can sell. You can sell those anytime you want when the market's trading. So um, very different investments. Real estate in general takes a little bit more time to liquidate. Um, yeah. so I think they're very different investments. Um, they can have some similarities, but, um, sort of just depends, depends on the circumstances of the individual client. That's where it's important to understand your balance sheet. I probably wouldn't want to have everything in just one of those and spread it out, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And I think, and get a good understanding of that real estate investment itself. If it's real property and it's going to be a rental property, there could be some tax advantages uh, that way as well. You can uh, depreciate the property as you go along, uh, but remember you're gonna have to recapture that depreciation when you finally do sell. Um, and, and Marty has a good point there on liquidity. It really makes sense that a REIT, you can, it's on the stock market. You could get in and out of it whenever you need to. Whereas the real estate, you're gonna, it's more of a long-term idea. Uh, very good. Very good. All right. Uh, Marty, we have a couple minutes left. Is there a favorite slide or two you want to get to? Yeah. Um, real quick, just one thing I might bring up too that I thought of when you were talking, Richard, about that question was um, there's private REITs out there. I'm generally not a fan of those. Uh, private REITs are similar to public REITs, but mm -hmm. but they uh, just less liquid, right? So you can ha have money tied up that you really can't get to. And uh you know, from what we've seen, the private REITs tend to perform about the same or if not worse than publicly traded REITs. So uh, generally stay away from those. I mean, I think there could be some exceptions, but for the most part, that I'd be very leery of private REITs. They generally pay high commissions to advisors and um, not always the best long term investment. So, yeah, no, that's, I had a, I had an experience with that with one of the clients and they had a REIT in Kentucky. And uh, it was a private REIT that they bought a long time ago. Luckily, they sold it uh, recently, so we were able to cash out. But it okay. caused you to do a, um, a Kentucky tax return. We had to do a yeah. Kentucky tax return each year just to have that REIT. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, be aware of what, what it is. And, and private is not always that great. You know, and and they're out, people are out there trying to sell them. Yeah. And sometimes you'll see people invest some insignificant amount of money into these deals and then they don't realize that they're they are just complicating their tax filing return for something that's really not worth it yeah right so yeah. that's going to be cognizant of if it's something that you want to do is it is it meaningful enough to even you know complicate something like a additional tax filing or is it easier to just pass on it yeah excellent all right 
focus on what you can control. Yeah. So as we're running out of time here, I think this slide's a good recap on just what do we want to think about? Um, we want to create an investment plan that's, that's customized, right, to a client's needs, their risk tolerance, um, structure a portfolio along the dimensions of expected return. So I, I think um, that's really preaching towards the uh, diversification element. We're going to have global diversification. We want to manage expenses. We want lower expenses are generally better, low turnover, and we want to minimize taxes. And then we're going to stay disciplined, right? We're not going to let our emotions take over when the market's going up and down. So these are really the things that we can control that we want to focus on. Everything else, like the headlines in the news or you know, what any individual company did uh, yesterday, that, that's really out of our control. Or we're, we're not as concerned about those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, fantastic job, Marty. That was a, a great, uh, great slides and great education there. Um, before we let you go, I want to speak to the attendees really quick. And um, uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us for these six weeks, uh, taking the time. Uh, hopefully you got a lot of education out of this and uh, some good understanding. Um, and we're going to be back in spring as well. So uh, keep an eye out. Uh, probably around April, beginning of April or so, we'll be starting our spring session, which will have uh, the Zoom and all of our locations, uh, which you can attend uh, either one. Uh, so thank you so much for being a part of, of the program and the workshops. And um, we'll see you uh, next year. Thanks, Marty. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, everyone.